So at this time, the state may proceed, and Ms. Carr. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, first and foremost, on behalf of my office in the Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office, and Bill Mason and my colleague, Mr. Richard Bombay, Ms. Lauren Bell, and Mr. Chris Schroeder, our law clerk, as well as the Cleveland Police Department, uh, our homicide detectives, Detective Smith and Detective Griffin. On behalf of the defense, and I know that they did, uh, thanked you as well, uh, Detective, I'm sorry, uh, Defense Counsel Rufus Sims, who I've had the pleasure of knowing my entire career, John Parker, and of course, I cannot leave out the judge. I've had the pleasure of trying a number of cases with this judge, and it has been a pleasure. But mostly, I need to thank you. Those of you who have never had jury service, you now know and can appreciate that it is a duty that should not be taken lightly. because over the past three weeks, you have heard from more than 62 witnesses. And as a it is up to you to rely upon your collective memories as far as what those witnesses testify to. It is your jurors to judge the credibility of those witnesses. So while you're sitting here listening to the testimony, and we kind of it's your job to make an assessment as to what you find believable and what you find simply unbelievable. You have the all, some, or none of what a witness has testified to. And while you're listening to that testimony, you also have to make a judgment call as to whether or not that particular uh, witness may have a motive in testifying in the way that he or she did. And when you take all of that and put it together, it's up to you to, again, and I reminded you of this during voir dire, I asked you to not leave your common sense at home. Because I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, none of you witnessed exactly what happened at 12205 Imperial Avenue. So in order to make a decision, a determination in this case, you will need to rely upon your common sense and your life experience. During the jury instructions on yesterday, the judge instructed you as it relates to circumstantial evidence and direct evidence. Direct evidence might be the testimony as to what a witness is testifying that he or she actually witnessed with his or her own eyes. Circumstantial evidence is that common sense evidence, and we kind of talked about that during voir dire, where you actually have to kind of draw your own conclusions or inferences based upon a situation such as if you go to sleep at night, when you retire, the ground is dry. When you wake in the morning, you see white stuff on the ground and on the grass, although you did not see it with your own two eyes. I'm pretty sure your common sense and life experience tells you it smelled. So as it relates to that evidence, that distinction between that circumstantial and direct, and you'll have the jury instructions in front of you, there's no difference. They both carry the same weight. There's no such thing as all the rectus back in circumstances circle equal weight. And you give the evidence in this case the weight that you believe is appropriate. And finally, we can't forget about the burden of proof. The burden of proof in this case is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Not all doubt in the world, but proof <laughs> keeping in mind the same type of proof that you would rely upon in dealing with your own affairs. Again, drawing in common sense and life experience. So take, for instance, if you get to that point during deliberations, and you say to yourself, well, I think that the defendant actually committed these crimes. 
However, I'm not sure if the state of Ohio proved it to me. Well, keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, if you have that thought, then obviously we must have proved something to you in order for you to formulate the belief that you think he did. So keep in mind, as it relates to this proof beyond a reasonable doubt, I'm not suggesting to you that number one is going to be an easy pass. But number two, and most importantly, again, keep in mind that it's reasonable. What's within reason? Now, the events that were set into motion on or about October 29, 2009, became the unveiling of a crime of ghastly proportions. Over the next few days, Cleveland, its surrounding suburbs, the state of Ohio, and all over these United States, people were in shock. Cleveland has a serial killer. Who would do such a crime? Who could commit such an act? Who murdered 11 women on Imperial Avenue? As jurors in this matter, only you can answer that question. It's a question that's burning inside the minds of millions. And based upon the evidence, based upon what you've heard over the past three weeks, the answer is clear. And the answer is based upon the evidence. And just as sure as you sit there right now, I think you know that the only person, the only person who could have committed these crimes, the only person that's solely and only responsible for the death of those 11 women, at 12205 Imperial Avenue, it's right there in this court, in the middle. And in case you've forgotten, his name is Anthony Sowell. And keep in mind, just in case you forgot a few minutes ago, this case is actually entitled State of Ohio versus Anthony Sowell. I know this because the case number is 530885. It's not State of Ohio versus the Cleveland Police Department. It's not State of Ohio versus the victims in this case, Gladys Wade. It's not State of Ohio versus Mary Mason. It's not the witnesses in this case. It's not our deceased victims. This is State of Ohio versus Anthony Sowell, and he is the only person that's on trial in this case. Not the victims, not the Cleveland homicide detectives, not the coroner's office. He is responsible for those 11 bodies that were found inside of his house and buried outside. So before I get to some of my thoughts, I thought it was important that I kind of address some of the arguments that were raised by the Pentagon sure they found no comfort in coming in here and telling you about their encounter with this defendant. I'm pretty sure it wasn't a pleasant experience for them and they came in and they told you truthfully. They didn't try to lie about it. Oh no, I wasn't on drugs. Oh yeah, I had a crack problem. I was trying to get high. And this guy over here, he was supplying me with a free high. They had to tell you about that. They had to go into their history, as far as their criminal history. And again, you must ask yourself, why would they lie? Who would want to be subjected to that? Who would want to go through this process all over again, as Gladys Wade indicated to you? That he did not issue charges on her case. She said, I knew that would happen, that they wouldn't believe me. These surviving victims testified by the fact that this system, it failed them. But notwithstanding, they put that aside, and they came in, and they provided the framework as to what went on at the defendant's home. The defense brought up that there are no eyewitnesses to this crime. 
well, I'm sorry, the 11 deceased victims at his house. Yeah, they're, you're right. They're not here to tell us what happened. But as Gladys Wade indicated, she's their voice. She's speaking, she's speaking on their behalf. I mean, how many people do you think would actually kill somebody in front of witnesses? Oh, I don't know. I mean, me personally, I can't say anyone's ever done it for me. It just doesn't happen. Most people don't kill people in front of other witnesses. I mean, that's the last thing you want to do is leave witnesses behind. I mean, because after all, now that would be crazy. Now that's something crazy. I'm going to kill 11 people, and I'm going to make sure that I have witnesses that actually see me do this. That's so dumb. What about no DNA? No DNA? Did you look at these bodies? I'm not going to show you the pictures again. The coroners testified that these victims were such in a state of decomposition. Did you see any blood? Yeah, you're right. No DNA. They had to be identified through family members. No DNA. No witnesses. And talk about being kidnapped. I mean, when you think about the legal definition of kidnap, and trust me, I guess for me, this is probably one of the textbook cases for me. I don't get this type of case in which I have people, women, bound by the hands, gagged at the mouth, bound by the ankles. If that's not kidnapping, then I don't know what is. I mean, I don't know. I guess if we were to get in the mind as it relates to defense counsel, I guess these victims actually bound themselves. Cash. They actually bound their legs, their ankles, and then they choked themselves, and then they dug a hole, and they buried themselves. Yeah. Doesn't that make a lot of sense? You know, defense counsel talked about how, you know, how do we know that these women were even buried there? Oh, I'm sorry. Now, I know the defendant, he said he's a good guy. He helped everybody in the neighborhood. He did plumbing. I guess he ran an all-night cemetery, too, because I guess people would just, hey, Tony, got a body here. Wonder if I could bury it in your yard. Hey, Tony, you think I could put this body in your basement? Because he's a nice guy. You know what I mean? Like defense counsel said, these women, they had mud on them. Who's to say they were actually buried there? They were buried somewhere else, and then Tony, being the nice guy that he is, yeah, sure, you can bury him in my backyard. As Kirk Jones from the coroner's office testified, that first body, the one that was buried in the yard, and we do believe that Christo Dozier was number one, <clears throat> that first body was buried with such sophistication. It took time. You look at the plastic. It was all nice and neat. I mean, I guess if that's the way you have to go. Hey, thanks, Tony, for burying Crystal so nicely. You had her all wrapped up, taped so nicely. Isn't that nice of him? Yeah. He took time with her before he buried her in the backyard. And after that, all bets were off. No more plastic. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Garbage bag here, carpet, rugs, whatever, whatever is available, that's how these women got buried. So when it comes to murder, if you think for one second that this is something that's nice and neat, it isn't. 